Hello, this is Susan Ashley. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I was given a message this morning, so I thought I would share it with you. I um, get messages from Spirit constantly, and some things I share on this platform, some things I share privately. It just depends, you know, so I thought I would do it. Um, well, they said to put it on this platform. So um, it's really... A, a, a very interesting time that we're living in right now mainly because there's a lot of uncertainty we don't know you know what's going to happen next and that uncertainty that feeling of uncertainty has replaced what we all used to know as friendships um, you know camaraderie things like this and that's been deteriorating for a very long time for at least two decades that I know that I've witnessed right so what happens with that is then people start to want to find a connection and that's why they go into these crazy cults or these crazy, um, let's say, political arenas and things like that because they're looking to be part of a tribe. They're looking to feel connected. They don't feel connected at home with their families because... They're being told that their families are the enemy in different ways. If their family doesn't agree with them, they're the enemy. And so we are being taught and, and given subliminal messages constantly throughout the day that other people are our enemy, our neighbours, if they don't... You know, I mean, years ago, you would have a neighbour that had a totally different nationality, religion or whatever, but you could still say hello, you were still there in case of emergencies... They, there was still, you know, a connection. These days, if they go against what you believe, then, you know, they're a terrorist or something. And this is, this is, not, this is not really helping any of us. So it's important for us at the moment to reach out to other people and also, you know, the iPads and iPhones and all of this stuff has disconnected us and connected us to AI. And as we've become more connected to AI, we've forgotten about our connection to other human beings, those organic connections. You know, I go out um, for lunch and you see a group of people and they're all on their phones. I mean, they're not even looking at each other whilst they're sharing a meal. It's kind of weird, you know. I actually went with a friend of mine who had a 13-year-old daughter and we met up for a drink and the daughter came with her friend. And they didn't really, like, you know, I was friendly, what would you girls like, etc., etc. Tried to engage in conversation, they weren't interested. And then they were on their phones and then all of a sudden they'd look at each other and start laughing. And I said to the mother, what are they doing? And she said, oh, they're, they're SMSing each other. So rather than actually having a physical conversation, they were sitting next to each other. They were literally SMSing each other. That for me is scary. And as a parent, I'm sorry, it wasn't, you know, I, I, it's not my movie, it's not my child, I'm not bringing them up, I don't have to, you know. But as a parent, I couldn't do that. Like we had, um, when, when my son was growing up, there was Nintendo and things like that. I wouldn't allow it. Yes, he had it at friends' places and he enjoyed it, but I wouldn't allow it because I wanted him to be outside enjoying nature and to rely on his own imagination. And that's another thing that kids don't seem to have once they start going to school is imagination and some prior to that, you know, because when you're on these machines you're being shown how to think and feel. It's not independent of yourself. It's being provoked within you. And I know that's a hard pill to swallow for parents because they're a great babysitter. But um, I know that all parents love their children and they want the best for their children. So maybe a little bit of time without those things would encourage another part of their brain to become activated. When you look at uh, teenagers or people in their early 20s who've grown up with this technology, they actually can't add 
they can't solve problems, they don't know what to do, and that's because their brain hasn't had the normal um, educational system and psychological growth that you need to have in order to be able to do those things, right? So that's why the education system was the way it was and it's why um, kids, you know, had different physical shifts in their bodies and they, they um, expressed those physical shifts naturally and that had a connection with their brain. So in other words, the more active you are, and there's been studies on it recently where they're seeing that kids' IQs are going down, 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 and they notice that children who weren't on these, um, you know, AI, I'm going to say AI, I don't care what people think, I'm going to say it, uh, the children that weren't constantly on those, their IQs were higher and they were better at problem solving, they had better memories. So as a parent, wouldn't you take that into consideration? Don't you want your child to um, have the best opportunity in life to be able to create the reality, the lifestyle that they want when they leave school? Of course you do. And you're being given the message, unfortunately, that you're a bad parent if you don't acquiesce to your child and give them all of these you know, things. But really what the child wants is a connection with you. But they're being taught that the connection with you is dumb. It's stupid. It's, it's uh, you know, they don't need it. And, and then you wonder why kids are um, wanting to, let's say, all kids explore gender. They actually do. At some point, they start to question things, especially when their hormones start developing. And, and this is normal. It's absolutely normal. And, um, and so there are certain parties on this planet that are taking advantage of that and screwing these kids' minds. And there's plenty of kids that now regret it, who are young adults that now regret what they did. And there are plenty that have been pushed into behaving so ir irreverent of their own sexuality that it's um, quite appalling to watch. So guidance, spirits um, call to you today is to pay attention to what you're listening to, what your children are listening to, how much time you're spending on these machines, how much time are you spending connecting with each other. Um, I know if you've worked a long day, like, you know, I, I was a single mother for a lot of years, so I totally get this, and I was exhausted. Um, I totally get what it's like when you, you know, have the evening and you're exhausted and you don't want to give any more. Like I have a job where I give to give a lot of my energy, time and expertise each day, so of course, in the evening, that's the last thing I want to do is to give to anyone. However, when you choose, I take the responsibility of choosing to have a child very seriously. And, and so I thought to myself, I, I remember, I'll just tell you something. When um, my son was two, I had him in daycare. I went back to work and it was like, crazy you know because as I said I was a single mother and uh, in in Australia they don't not all daycares give um, food to the kids you know you have to pack their their lunch and their snacks and everything to take with them and um, and so the, my weekends were basically spent uh, cleaning shopping getting ready for the week ahead um, you know organizing his week of food pretty much and um, my schedule as well so I remember one weekend I was I was I was doing something and my son came towards me and he was like mommy you know he wanted to show me something and I put my hand out and I said not now mommy's busy and I I looked up and I saw the look on his face I crushed him and I thought I can't do this I can't, I can't do this. 
so I decided, I made a, a decision to um, cut my hours to have him in daycare because I was the first to take my child to daycare and the last to pick him up. And um, I decided I would rather be have less money and more time with him. So I cut my hours to three days a week and only from nine till three o'clock. So I only worked then. And then I would work at night. I was, I was one of those um, people who had a very good, you know, when you have a boy, you have to have a lot of discipline with boys in the sense of they need boundaries, they need time frames, they need schedules. So I, um, I put all of that into action. So he would go to bed at six on the clock, right, and fall asleep beautifully. So I could work at night. I'd have clients come to the house sometimes or sometimes I'd do it over the phone or I used to write a lot of articles so I'd do some writing or something like that. So I, I, I worked at night and I worked three half days a week. And I did that until he went to school. And then when he went to school, I only worked till about two so I could pick him up from school every day. So I reduced my income and I chose my child. And it was difficult. It was hard. I mean, I, I didn't have luxuries or, or anything like that. Um, because I saw that it was crushing him. He just wanted a connection with me. And I was too busy to give it to him that day. And um, I decided, well, okay, so do we need all these things, you know? Do kids need, like I, I hear a lot of them, a lot of people say to me, but my child needs this and they need, do they? Do they? Do you remember, like I, I, didn't, I didn't have the money to buy toys and things like that. My luxury was to be able to take him to a cafe once a week for a treat. That was our luxury. And in the meantime, especially when he was really little, pots and pans, bits of water, um, the garden. We used to have a garden that had a slope on it, so we'd get cardboard and slide down the side. We'd laugh all afternoon, you know, go for walks in the bush, um, make things together. You know, he used to cook with me. Um, he's a very good cook now. Um, things like this, you know. Um, you do. I did things. I did things. And I think people are thinking they're under this illusion that they have to work all these hours to um, give their child an advantage over the other children. But are you? Are you? Because I will tell you, my child never got sick, never got sick, never missed a day of school, loved school, loved learning, and doesn't miss a day of work now, is very smart. And, um, you know, I mean, all kids go through rough times in their teenage years. They all do it. You've just got to hold the love for them. Uh, depends how far off they go. You know, I was kind of fortunate in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that's because we had a strong foundation. You know, kids need to know who's got the power, especially when they're really young. And I say this to a lot of parents, like when, when your child is older and they're exploring different things, do you want them to feel safe enough to come to you and say, Mum, Dad, I, you know, stuffed up and this has happened and I don't know what to do. Or, you know, this is happening and I'm afraid I don't know what to do. Do you want them to come to you when they have a problem? Well, most parents would say yes, right? Most parents would go, of course I do. I love my child deeply. Oh, of course I want them. Well, they're not going to if, if they have all the power when they're really young. Because in their consciousness, right, in their experience, they have been able to get everything they wanted through a small tantrum. And you are, an, you are, you are not powerful at all because they've been able to over, override you again and again and again. So therefore, not only 
are you powerless, you're stupid, and you are not capable of helping them when they have a problem. So that's why they don't come to you. They go to their silly friends who are the same age as them that haven't got a clue either, and then they make really bad decisions. And they try to hide it from you in different ways or hide it from themselves, and that is just a slippery slope. So if you really... Look, I know that 99% of uh, people love their kids. You know, there's a few out there that don't. Um, but most people do. And they want the best for their children. And if you want the best for your children, you're going to give them a good start. And you don't give them a good start by teaching them that you're stupid and you're powerless and um, decreasing their IQ. Right, because when they're interacting with things, with uh, like toys or bikes or uh, you know trucks or dolls or whatever, they're learning how to make mistakes and how to solve those mistakes. They're, that's what they're learning, and um, we we don't teach them that anymore at the schools. The schools don't teach. Schools are teaching sexual orientation to. Seven-year-olds. I mean, what, what's that all about? It's crazy, right? It's crazy. Why do they need to know that? They don't. If you think about what did you know at that age? I, I didn't know anything. I knew it was boys and girls, but I didn't know anything besides that. And um, it wasn't in my mind to want to know either. And of course I wanted to be pretty, every girl wants to be pretty and every boy wants to be perceived as strong, but I didn't want to be sexual, right? So you see, things are all very muddled up and it's up to us as parents, not the government. We think it's the government, the education system. I remember talking to a parent years ago and um, we were talking about sex ed and I said, um, they said to me, oh, I said, oh, have you spoken to, you know, we were away. I said, oh, have you spoken to them about, you know, sexual in general, sex in general? And No, 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 that's the school's job. I said, really, you think it's the school job? Oh, yeah, I don't want to ever talk to my child about that. That's the school's job. And I said, well, you know, I would tend to disagree. I think the school's job is biology, but it's not sexuality or sex. They can teach the biology, but there's more to sex than, than, than that. There's all the feelings that are involved, the hormones that go rapidly up and down, the lack of confidence that young boys go through and girls, you know, the emotional up and downs, the changes in their body. Um, you know, and I said, well, yeah, I, I spoke to my child about it and I just you know, sat down and had a conversation about feelings around sex and what he could expect with regards to his body's response without him actually really understanding it. Your body's going to start responding like this physically and this is, you know, normal so that kids don't think they're abnormal. So I think it's important to discuss that, that emotional side to you know, sex. I think that's really important. It's not up to the school to teach that. It's up to you. And it's up to you to teach morals to your child as well. Goodness and honesty and all of these things. I can't tell you how many young men I've sat in front of that are a mess. And the reason they're a mess is because they don't have any mentors that match what they're feeling. You see, they're trying to hold themselves to a standard of being an asshole, right? They're trying to hold themselves to a standard of being a ruthless asshole that only thinks of money and it's, uh, what is it, uh, money at all costs, you know. Um, we have to make a profit at all costs and it doesn't matter. Business is business. You know, you hear these sayings? Business is business. What happens in business is just business. It's not personal. Well, it shit is. Shit is, right? This is, I, I'm, I'm over all this stuff. Oh, it's, you should, you know, 
yeah, there are some things you shouldn't take personally, but there are things that you friggin' well should. If someone rips you off and they turn around and say to you, oh, it's just business, we can still be friends, I take it personally. No, it's not business. You don't have to be an asshole and a rip-off merchant and a creep to be in business. No, you don't. And this is what these young men are being shaped to be and some of them don't want to be like that because inside they're feeling something completely different. And this is a huge issue in society, huge issue. You know, so Spirit wanted me to discuss this today because there's a big calling out there from parents. They don't know what to do. You've got to create boundaries from a young age because the younger they are, the quicker it, it happens. See, this is the thing that people don't realise. That's why they're going for the really young ones. You know, I worked um, for, for a number of years, I worked with families as a, as a therapist for children who had, let's say, uncomfortable behaviour for their parents. And, and the way that I did it was I didn't work with the kids. You know, people would come to me and say, oh, I've got this child, you know, etc. And I, I need you to work with them and to fix them, fix the kid, right? And I'd say, oh, I can't really do that, but I can fix you because you're the parent. You, why would I do that? Because the parent is the biggest influencer in a child's life. Okay, you might say, yeah, yeah, the school influences them, but so does the parent if they're active in their life. They influence them. And especially when they're young, right? So what, what I know is that a young child can change a behavioural pattern in three days. Three days. So I want you to think about that. Your young child is going to school and in three days they can learn a different behavioural pattern that can stay with them for the rest of their life. That's how absorbent they are. You know, their brain is like a sponge at that time because everything's growing and they're creating new synapses, this new neurological pathways. It's all created when they're really young. So you can actually transform a child in three days in a positive way, right? You can undo that. But as they get older, so they're moving into teenage years, it takes longer. Once they're a teenager, well, then you've really got a battle on your hands because teenagers um, can be very, very defiant. They've got a lot of hormonal responses going on. They've got a lot of influence from their friends because when they become teenagers, their friends become more important than their family. And they also go through a period of being selfish. This is normal. They are thinking about themselves and themselves alone. So you have to appeal to that selfishness, that that, that side of them, you know. Um, overbearing them and being nasty to them and calling them names and berating them and belittling them doesn't work. It really doesn't. So that's why you've got to establish a relationship with your child before that happens. However, if you haven't, you can still change it. It's just going to take a lot longer and it's going to maybe incorporate other people to do it. But it's not about sending the child to a therapist because I'm telling you, the, child, the child's behaviour is a response to something. So that's why I would say to the parents, no, I can't work with you, but I will work, I, I can't work with your child, but I'll work with you. And the way I did it back then, I know this is really far-fetched, it sounds crazy, but I would have them come and stay with me in my home. And I would have the child, because my son was young and um, I needed to move out of the sort of work that I was doing prior to him, you know, when I worked in, in, in deep sexual abuse and SRA and everything, I didn't want that around my son when he, was, when he was really little especially. So I changed the way I worked. And um, I would invite families to come and stay with me for a few days so that therefore I could have my son there and um, and also, you know, earn an income as well and help other people. So it was a sort of a win-win all round. 
and um, you know often they'd stay from sort of like maybe Thursday evening to Monday or something like this and um, the parents were astounded because I didn't I didn't have much contact with the kids because they're their children it's not for me to tell their kids what to do so their their children would just be you know playing and and, and doing different things. So we did it in a way that the children didn't feel they were a problem. Because if you put that burden on your child and you're sending them to a therapist just to wipe your hands clean of the situation, you're actually telling your child they are a problem. And this is very damaging to a child, right? It's very damaging because they see themselves as a problem for the rest of their life. And I don't think a lot of people really realise that because there's a lot of people making money out of working with kids and a lot of those people who are working with kids are not really working with them in the sense of a lot of them are pedophiles. I'm just going to say it straight. And that's why they're motivated to work with them singularly like that. Never, ever leave your child with a professional unattended without you, I mean, without you being there. And I don't care what the doctor or the psychiatrist or whomever says you are to be there because I'm telling you now the stories that I've heard the people that I've had sit in front of me and what they've told me would kill you to listen to so don't do it don't do it and if they are offended by that that's their problem that's their problem you know I, I would have um Parents say to me, like if they came for a session, oh, can my child come with me? Sure. It's your child. If you want them to hear this or you don't, that's up to you. You're the parent. Right? So we, we can literally transform our children in a very short period of time. And I, I believe that there are, some really good people that are starting to create communities or camps where I was I was thinking about this myself where parents can go with their kids and be without Wi-Fi or without any of that stuff and reconnect and I think this is really important because there's such a push for disconnection when we're moving into unity consciousness it's very fascinating to me so um, I think that's about all I, I, that Spirit wanted me to say for the moment. Maybe I'll get something else and I'll, I'll give a message. You know, I only make these videos when I'm, when I'm um, encouraged to or motivated to in the sense of if I've got something to say. There's no point, you know, like a lot of people make them every day or every week and, and what they're doing is they're drawing people in. They're drawing you in. So they're hooking into your energy. And I see this a lot. And I, I don't want to be participate in that crap. I really don't. And um, I know that this, what I just said, is going to piss a lot of people off. But um, I, I, don't see the, I don't see the, you know, worth in repeating stuff. A lot of them are just repeating every day the same thing. I don't see why one would need to do that when you can oh yeah I get it you know I've just got an answer really yeah because they're content makers so they're they're reading stuff and then they're giving it to you they're not actually working with people like I do and many others do there are many of us that work with people and create help to co-create change in people's lives and in their families and there are those that create content I'm not a content creator I'm a co-creator and I want to co-create with you the world that you want your children to live in and in order for you to do that you've got to look at your kids and spend time with them and yeah they're going to throw a tantrum when you start taking away what they really want they're going to throw a tantrum and you just need to be ready for it you know the big thing for me was um do, yes, I, I want my son to love me and I also want my son to like me as a person. But at some point in his growth, I had to choose, 
Am I going to be his friend or am I going to be his parent? And I just decided to be his parent. And I'll never forget, you know, when he was like 14, I think, was the only time he ever told me he hated me and it crushed me. And even to this day, when I think of it, it crushes me. Um, and I made a decision that he thought was wrong because he was, you know, he's a teenager. He was emotional. He didn't want to move. And we needed to move to create a different life, you know, a, 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 a better life in a lot of ways. So um, he didn't really have a say in it. He was like, oh, I want to be with my friends. You know, he was very emotional. He wanted to stay with his friends and everything. And a lot of people might say, oh, but, you know, children need a stable environment. Yeah, they do. They need a stable environment. And if you can't live in the same place your whole life and create it in that way, you create it by setting uh, time frames and boundaries. So we get up at this time, we eat at this time, we do this, we do that, we go to bed at this time. So they have something to anchor to. And most importantly, they have you to anchor to. That you're always there, right? So that was the only time. You know, I hate you, you ruined my life, you took me away from my friends. And my response was, well, I'm your parent and I have to look, I can, I can see into the future. You know, I can see what's coming. And so for me, this is the best choice that we need to make. And I know you hate me right now and you don't think it's a good choice. In years to come, you'll thank me for it. A lot of things he's thanked me for since then, you know. Um, a lot of different things which I could talk about for hours. But, you know, you, you can't be your child's best friend. You chose to be their parent. You chose to have that child. Whether it was an unexpected pregnancy or not, you still chose to go ahead with it. You chose to bring the child into the world. So be a parent, not a friend. And it's great to be able to do those things. And you become friends when they get older, but not when they're young. Right? Because when they get older and they go out and they work, you have to treat them like an adult. So then you, you know, you can become friends with them and understand what their belief systems are and, and um, you know, listen to what they're doing during the week at work or something like that. But it, it's not, you don't do that when they're young. You have to be a parent. It's not easy and it's exhausting and I know that for a fact. You can get really tired, especially when you're not indulging them. But, you know, it's interesting because I, I just want to speak to that. You know, pa parents think, oh, well, if they're on the technology, then they're quiet and they're not disturbing me and I can have my conversation with my friends or my glass of wine or cook dinner without being disturbed or whatever. Then let them cook with you. Yeah, let them cook with you. Teach them how to cook. Teach them how to do housework. I did. I did. And and people thought, mm, that's a bit tough. Well, why? It's his room. He should be able to clean it. Right? So you teach them how to do these things. They do it with you. So they're with you. If you have to do it, then they do it with you. They do the gardening. They help clean the house. They can help to cook. They're not silly. They're very capable. So you can, you can do that together. There's lots of things you can do with your kids that is not, um, you know, like difficult to do. But often what will happen is when you get them off those things, which was my point, they will go and find something to do. They'll go make something. They'll go ride something. They'll go climb a tree. They'll want to plant a garden. They will go and do physical things. And you may think, that they're not going to do that because for two days they've been screaming for it. But on the third day, they will. Okay, So I'm going to love you and leave you on that. And that's what Spirit wanted me to share with you today. And I, I don't know if it's going to be any value to you whatsoever. But I just decided to honour what I've been asked to do. Bye for now.